On Sundays when we read the gospel and the epistle, Holy Mother, the church wants us to, as good ground, receive the word of God that it might bring forth fruit. There are many things we can consider in the epistle and gospel, but I'd like to focus on two particular points. First of all, when we think of the parables of Christ, our Lord was the greatest of all teachers. No one had ever spoken like he has spoken. Even his enemies who hated him, they could not refute him, and they had to admit, never has a man spoken as this man has spoken. And also when we think of our Lord, our Lord being the true Messiah, he fulfilled the, the prophecies that were made about the Messiah long before he came, where he would be born, under the circumstances, the time of, you know, what was happening during those times, etc. But one of, the par- one of the prophecies was, I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter things unheard of since the beginning of the world. One of the beautiful things about the teachings of Christ is that they are timeless. We understand the parable that Christ said about the sower throwing out the seed. And even if the world lives for many, many more centuries, those parables, those teachings of Christ are going to always be relevant. And that is something that's absolutely, particularly wonderful. The teachings of Christ are for all, both learned and simple. You don't have to be, you know, some Einstein to understand what he just said. They are so clear, so simple, and yet there's food for thought for all of us. That is a beautiful thing about Jesus and his teachings. Now, when we think of the gospel for today, how important it is that we realize in the world there are some people, when they hear the word of God, as our Lord has said, it either falls on the path and is trampled underfoot, it falls on the rock or falls amongst the thorns. There are many people who, when they hear the word of God or they're exposed to the truth, it doesn't bring forth fruit. But my dear friends in Christ, that is what God wants all of us to bring forth fruit in our lives. He wants us to truly practice virtue, truly grow in grace, and truly be another Christ, a light to the world, the salt of the earth. That's what our Lord has asked us to be. Those of you who are going to be confirmed today, just remember, you're going to become soldiers of Christ. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. You're going to get special graces to help you to be a soldier of Christ. The Holy Ghost with the sacrament of confirmation is going to enlighten your mind, and he's going to strengthen your will to know and to do God's will. You're going to have the graces of confirmation the rest of your life. You can only be confirmed once. You'll be soldiers of Christ. I'm sure all of you have thought carefully about the name you're going to re- receive when you get confirmed. You pick a show, uh, maybe a, a patron saint that you particularly like or look up to. Remember to pray to that patron saint and ask them to help you to be a true soldier of Christ. One of the beautiful things when, I, when we think of the epistle and the gospel is I think of St. Paul's epistle, and this I think of throughout the whole year. It's not just on Sex of Jesus of Sunday I think about this, but St. Paul goes through all these incredible sufferings, scourged, stoned, shipwrecked, imprisoned, in danger of his life all the time, and hunger and thirst and all these things. And then he's worried about all his churches. And to top it off, as if he didn't have enough to worry about, enough to endure, God allowed a temptation in his life, a a sting of the flesh, a buffet of Satan. Now, humanly speaking, humanly speaking, St. Paul might say, come on, uh, how much more can I take? He didn't say that. He asked God to deliver him from this temptation. And what did God say? My grace is is sufficient for thee. St. Paul says, my strength is in my weakness. And you might say, what? Strength and weakness? Exactly. 
when we are weak and we acknowledge we're weak, we go to God and by his grace, he supports us and sustains us and helps us and we're strong. Let us remember this. I, I like to be what we call a realist. I like to look at things the way they really are. But besides realists, there's also pessimists and there's optimists. An optimist says everything's hunky-dory, everything's great. No, there's no problems out there. Reminds me of the, the father who was trying to be father optimist, Mr. Optimist. He asked his son, how are you doing in school? Dad, I failed. Son, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear some really positive stuff. He said, Dad, I'm positive I failed. <laughs> okay. The other extreme is the pessimist. You ever go fishing with a pessimist? I tell you, I have. If I had this one person out to go fishing with me, I'm never going to catch them. I don't, I don't never catch fish. I, it's just, that's not me. I'm not going to catch any fish. I know. You just try, huh? Get in the boat. We're fishing. And then the pessimist said, I'm getting a bite. You know, he's going to probably just eat my bait and get away with it and spit it out. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Oh, he's on the line. He's going to probably, I'm a really, person's pessimist reeling in. Oh, he can probably get off the line. I don't know. Just give it a try. You know, it comes in and brings a fish in. Oh, look how small it is. <laughs> At that point, I was ready to take the fish and go whack. <laughs> okay, that's a pessimist. But, you know, we have to be realist. What does it mean to be real? It means to look at things the way they really are. Look at ourselves, the world, and also in perspective of who God is. We're all weak. We all have our particular temptations and faults and failings and sins that we struggle with. And not, and not only that, but we look at the world we live in. Not so good. I mean, very, very bad. But we can't give up. It seems like all the enemies of God have converged in so many different areas to try to destroy his church, to destroy souls, and it can get very, very depressing. Then we look at our own weakness and say, well, it seems impossible. But remember St. Paul's words, my strength is in my weakness. When we are weak, we go to God and ask for his help. Are we weak? Of course we are. That's why we need to frequent the sacraments, receive the sacraments fervently. When we go to confession, we kneel down, bless me, Father, for I have sinned. This might be, this might be the very last confession I ever make in my life. Same thing when we receive Holy Communion. When we receive Jesus and Holy Communion, that might be our very last Holy Communion. You'd never know, never know. And how important it is to remember when we pray our prayers, truly think of what we're saying and mean them from our heart. God is ready and willing to help us. He's, he's going to take care of us. But he wants us to come to him as a father and ask for his help. Our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, his words when he walked this earth visibly amongst men, he said, come to me all you that labor and are burdened and now refresh you. We need God. We need his help. And, you know, we need to have a good relationship with God. As we, as we said before, when we talk to God in prayer, it's not long distance. It's always a local call. He's always present. And we get unlimited minutes, too. We can talk to God all we want throughout the day. It's kind of interesting how sometimes God brings us sometimes right to an edge in life and then out of the blue, just kind of just snatches us up and takes care of things. He's reminding us that he's there and he's willing to help us. As we were saying, I like to be a realist. The world we live in, is it in good shape? Not at all. I'm sure many of you have heard about the, the, the horrible, immoral law that New York, City, New York has passed. The governor of New York signed an abortion law, abortion all the way up to the time of delivery, and if the abortion does not have its effect, if the baby is born alive, you can still kill the baby. This is absolutely positively horrific. Absolutely horrific. And Virginia's following suit, and Rhode Island's following suit, and other you know, states are 
getting on board. And this just goes to show us that these abortionist Planned Parenthood, they have all along never really cared about human life. They have never cared about the sacredness of human life. They tried to deny that that unborn infant, even in the earlier stages of the fetus, is a human life. But now they're not hiding anything. They're out in the open. You know what was horrible is when the governor signed it, the, the legislature clapped, they cheered, they shouted, they lit up the lights in New York City to celebrate the murder of infants. When people ask me about that, I just say, well, you know, that's why there's a place called hell. There are some people, this is the mind-boggling thing, there was an abortionist doctor who got shot down when he was leaving his church on Sunday. And I'm thinking, an abortionist kills babies and he's going to church? What utter blindness. I'm not advocating that. What was done by shooting him, killing him, was wrong. Two wrongs don't make a right. But the fact that he could leave a church as an abortionist and get gunned down, I mean, that's just, that he went to church is just preposterous. It shows the blindness that can sometimes set in. But he perhaps justified what he did. And, you know, there's some people who say, God is love. Yes, he is. God is merciful. Yes, he is. But Jesus, who was so meek and humble of heart, 15 times he talked about the fires of hell. 15 times. And where there'll be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. Hell is a real place. I'm sure you have heard of Archbishop Fulton Sheehan. If I remember correctly, he opened up one talk by saying, the hell there ain't. He said, the hell there is. There is a place called hell, and people go there. And it's not a game or a joke, not a game or a joke. And these politicians who want votes and want their position of authority, they're willing to sell their soul, sell their soul for votes and for that position. What an what a absolute blindness. But we be real, let's be real. The world and the situation, circumstance, world is not good. And especially you parents, you worry about your children. There's so many occasions of sin out there. You struggle to f keep them on the right path, to keep them from, from evil. Not an easy, not an easy uh, task, not an easy vocation. But just remember this, the grace of God will sustain you. Ask every day God to help you to be a good mom, to be a good dad, to love your children, to discipline them when necessary with love and with firmness and also with, with that gentleness that our Lord gives us the example. But let us remember this. St. Paul, the St. Paul who suffered so much, went through so many hardships, even he went through temptation. Let's never get discouraged when we have temptation. Temptation can sometimes get us depressed, like, oh my gosh, I'm such a wretch. I, I, these temptations are horrible. No temptation is a sin as long as we don't want it. Even the saints went through temptation. But let us remember, recognize our weakness, and then go to God who is our strength. As long as we pray in time of temptation, as long as we say we don't want it, we don't consent, no sin. In fact, it's actually virtuous because God tested us and we passed that test. So I'd like to say in general and in closing, let us remember our strength is in our weakness. Are we weak? Yes. Is God almighty and powerful and all present, ready to help us? Absolutely. And we also have our blessed mother, all the angels and saints as our intercessors, ready to help us and assist us as well. Those who are going to be confirmed today, congratulations on becoming soldiers of Christ. Remember now is a beginning. We're going to fight the good fight and keep the faith. We're going to do our very best to be a good example to all those who see us. We're going to be different. We're going to truly be Christ-like, keep God's commandments, pray our prayers, receive the sacraments. And of all the things, most importantly, let us be noted for our charity. By this will all men know that we are Jesus' followers, that we love one another. Charity, as St. Paul tells us later on, is kind, is forgiving, is not puffed up, is not envious. 
and does its best to treat one another as we would treat Christ. So those of you confirmed, congratulations again on becoming soldiers of Christ. Uh, after Holy Mass, when Father uh, concludes with the last gospel, because confirmation is following, you don't need the three Hail Marys and the lay nine prayers, so you just go right into the sacristy. Father will get changed. And we'll come right back out and go into the sacrament of confirmation. Remember those who are sponsors, right hand and the right shoulder. And also, those who are sponsors, remember, you're like a spiritual parent to those who are being confirmed. So pray for them and exhort them to the practice of their faith. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.